All right. So um, good morning, everyone on Zoom and our our group here who made it in person to Pritzker. Yay. Yay. There's going to be like Matt is saying, there's going to be increasing awards and incentives for people who come in person. So just get ready. Um, it is my um, uh, privilege and honor to um, introduce our grand round speaker today, um, friend and colleague, Dr. Maureen Tulu-Shams. Um, just there's tons of things I could say about her, but We'll, we'll do this. Um, Dr. Marina Tulu-Shams is a professor in residence and uh, an inaugural vice chair for community engagement, outreach, and advocacy uh, for our Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, she's also the deputy vice chair of research in psychiatry at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Um, she's trained as a pediatric and forensic psychologist and has many years of providing direct clinical care in the community. Her clinical community work and direct care experiences inform partnerships and collaborations with youth, families, and systems to intentionally co-design and implement research studies. She leads the UCSF Juvenile Justice Behavioral Health, uh, JJBH Lab, whose mission is to improve behavioral health outcomes for youth who come into contact with juvenile justice, child welfare, and the foster care system. With over 100 peer review publications, her NIH funded studies aim to improve youth's physical, mental, and emotional health, reduce drug and alcohol use, reduce HIV STI risk behaviors, and prevent system re entry. Her studies also include a special emphasis on gender and trauma responsive interventions for girls in juvenile justice system, as well as reaching as researching ways to leverage technology to improve access to behavioral health care for justice impacted and foster care youth and families. And she's also um, a strong committed mentor and very invested in uh, raising up our next generation of mental health providers and researchers uh, through community uh, projects, including with high school students through SF um, Change, Change SF. So it's my, so let's welcome. Always a, a treat to have the opportunity to be introduced by a mentor, colleague, and friend. So thank you so much. Lisa. And a treat to also be with the department um, to talk about really all of our team's work. So you just heard about me, but there's a mighty team that is behind all of this work. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I was uh, explaining to our chair, Dr. State, that I'm trying some new technology pieces within a technology talk. So I'm gonna have some disclosures about technology not being a panacea and we're gonna see how this goes. So, um, so no disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. And just like I was saying, mighty team, um, many of whom are in the audience right now um, and showed up in person, thank you. Um, and we really want to acknowledge everybody, all the funders, NIH, foundation support, anonymous, generous donors, um, the technology platforms and partners, study colleagues, including Dr. Fortuna, Dr. Porch here at UCSF and others, and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and other city partners for this work because we can't do it without any of these um, partners. So here's some snapshots of our team. Uh, our mission is to leverage technology for good to expand behavioral health care access for system impacted youth. As I was mentioning though, I'd like us to have uh, some things right at the front of our mind when I'm presenting this work, because there are some really major cautions in doing this work around technology and health equity. Technology is not a panacea, and we must come to this work with, by questioning assumptions that technology advances consistently benefit human health. We have to consider potential gains and harms all of the time and have that present. And here are some scholars who really do this work well. Ruha Benjamin at Harvard has been doing this work um, for years and has published a book, Race After Technology, um, which is talking about how technology advances are potentially perpetuating 
racial disparities, particularly in mechanisms like AI and these other algorithmic type of um, interventions. And Design Justice is an incredible book by Sasha Costanza Chalk, who talks about community-led practice to build the world we need, and really talks about building these technology interventions to advance equity, considering all in all of the intersections, all the intersectionality that we bring to this work and the populations whom we serve. And then a recent New York Times op-ed by our very own Dr. Adriana Aguilera, um, who is also a co-investigator on um, one of the studies that I might talk about today and has done an excellent op-ed recently, Therapy for People Who Can't Go to Therapy, and really speaks eloquently about the need to consider these issues when we're developing technology to advance health care access for minoritized populations. Just quickly, some key definitions for those who may not be familiar with this work. When we're talking about system impacted youth, we're talking about adolescents and young adults through age 26 who have had some type of contact with the juvenile legal and or child welfare system. AB 12 was created in California. It's our extended foster care program, which allows eligible child welfare and probation youth to remain in foster care up to the age of 21 and receive services. In-home placement, sounds like it might be obvious, but maybe not everyone knows what we mean by that, which means families that are court involved through the dependency courts, child welfare, but the youth remains in the home. The idea is to prevent them from out of home placement which is the next definition where court is involved, the family's involved in dependency court, but the youth is placed out of home. And I'm bringing this up because I don't know if you're aware, but in San Francisco County in particular, 75% of youth who are placed out of home are also placed out of county. And that has really informed our work around advancing behavioral health care access for youth who are placed out of home, out of county. And then kinship care, when youth are court involved through dependency courts, but resource foster care is provided by a relative or sometimes a close family friend. So let's just talk for a moment about what is tequity, because that's a relatively new term and particularly to the literature and it's being heavily used in healthcare systems and kind of business and technology realm. And more recently, as of 2021, there have been some publications around moving this work into the social justice health equity arena. And Ri et al. defines it as a strategic development and deployment of technology to promote health equity and comes up with four pillars around this work that I want you to think about as we go forward in talking about our projects. Workforce diversity, this is where health and technology organizations and leadership represent the diversity of the people they serve. Data trust, this is a big one, Collected, collecting data with trust and representative of the populations they're intended to serve. Transparent artificial intelligence, similar to kind of what I was mentioning about Ruha Benjamin's work, Dr. Benjamin's work, um, having AI methodology with transparency, ethics, fairness, and equity in mind at the forefront, and then creating equity dashboards. You know, a lot of this has come up in the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, around algorithms predicting who is going to get infected or who has gotten infected and what are the factors associated with getting um, uh, COVID-19 and all of the racial disparities that have been discovered as being perpetuated by these algorithms that are replete with biases. So um, recently Clark and Al, and there's a journal um, of the um, Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved, if anyone's interested, has multiple articles on this issue around tequity and bringing a social justice and anti-racism lens to tequity. This is new in our field. All of this work is really nascent um, and I'm, saying that as a pitch for anyone who wants to you know, think about this in your various areas. But um, Clark et al. brings uh, five action steps forward in doing this work that we bring to our work, some of, and some um, we would need to consider to add. So one is investing in people and communities. I'm going to talk a lot about that today across various projects. Um, what, the second is similar to Re et al., be trustworthy collect data that are relevant to diverse communities, but Clark adds this aspect of keeping it secure. One of the things, sorry, is it going in and out? It's okay? Okay. One of the things um, is that we have to be thinking about how to develop trust with the communities whom we're serving and trying to expand care access for. 
uh, using AI and analytics to promote health equity. We, that's consistent with RE. Purchasers of tech must also drive change. So this is interesting. This is about who you partner with as a health system or as a research group and ensuring that you're partnering with tech and other partners who have equity and anti-racism and social justice at the forefront of their technology efforts. And the last is to develop innovative partnerships that engage diverse communities. And I'll talk about how we, we're working on that piece. Why is this critical for youth injustice? Well, I just wanna present you a snapshot um, of 2019 annual data. This is reported in the Burns Institute report from the San Francisco Closed Juvenile Hall Working Group that was commissioned by the Board of Supervisors that I was a part of for two years. The report revealed that San Francisco has, I would say the starkest racial disparities in the country relative to other states and cities and counties, even within California. So what the take home message of this is, is that we in San Francisco for black youth are 38 times more likely to be detained than a white youth. It's off the charts. So if there's nothing I wanna leave you with is that, and that we have a lot of work to do in a lot of different areas um, in this city. So why is the focus on behavioral health equity also needed for this population where 38 times more black youth are entering into detention? Well, 70% of adolescents entering juvenile detention centers have a diagnosable mental health need. And we see this level of need even at the first time contact with the juvenile court system. So our own work has shown that youth who are about 14 and a half years old who come into first time contact with the court system, an immense opportunity to intervene and expand care access before they land in detention. One in three have a history of psychiatric di diagnosis. One in five have a history of inpatient hospitalization. And one in two have current psychiatric symptoms severe enough to receive treatment. And if we talk on a national level, we have 31 million youth nationally under juvenile court jurisdiction. Um, Dr. Joanna Folk, who's part of our team has been leading work looking at adverse childhood experiences in this group of young people who come into first time contact, 75% of them report an average of three ACEs at very first time of juvenile court contact. We know that 50% of youth in community supervision, which means on probation or in diversion, require substance use treatment. And we also know that the access to care is very minimal. 16% of those youth who come into the system, 70% having a diagnosable mental health need, 38 more times more likely to be Black youth, are leaving 16%, only 16% or fewer get treatment when they leave detention and go back into the community. It's a setup for them to not succeed, to not have healthy outcomes. So that's really the main point of why we're thinking about this tech equity work. Now I wanna to say too, there's always this question of if you develop these tech interventions, is there a want, is there a need from the youth and families? And we did a national study that looked at asking caregivers of justice-involved youth whether or not they would be interested in participating in behavioral health interventions online. And 61% said they would on a national level. So that has also informed some of the direction of our work around a particular project being more caregiver oriented. So just reiterating our approach, um, we take a community engaged approach, we build our projects seated by the community and the systems for questions that they want to answer or interventions that they wanna build. We bring a social justice to our lens as I was talking about and a health equity lens. And we engage in this term participatory co-design that is out of um, UCLA that started and with one of our partners, Chorus Technologies and other researchers down at UCLA, um, where it's the combination of bringing together community-based participatory research approaches to developing and testing interventions and merging that with tech design and literally co-designing the technologies with the populations 
whom you're serving with that technology. And we layer that onto an echo developmental framework. Shapoznik out of the University of Miami, Jose Shapoznik has um, really expanded Bronfenbrenner's original ecological theory model to include multiple other layers to the eco-developmental framework that surround the young people whom we serve. Um, so you start off with the individual. We actually do very few individual interventions because for this population, there actually there's not much efficacy to those um, interventions. Family-based is uh, where a lot of the gold standard interventions are in a family-based approach for these young people. Um, and then we move into extra familial, the exo layer, looking at culture, neighborhoods, schools, and then the macro level. And so we have a project right now that's at the systems level in San Francisco city and county, bringing together partners from the various child welfare probation systems to develop cross system strategies to increase access to care through technology. And that's an example of a macro layer intervention. So we really try to target out. We do offer individual, and I'll talk about that a little bit with one of our projects, but we really do also want to have family-based interventions and more macro level interventions so that we're targeting these health inequities and this lack of access to care at multiple levels across the eco-developmental framework that holds this young person. And then these are just some publications um, that I wanna highlight with some amazing colleagues in this room as well, um, that really we're, we're forced to think critically about this work. And when young people were detained during COVID-19 and um, we, we actually put out a call to action for juvenile detention facilities to take it on, to have the technologies to initiate family-based telehealth treatment. Um, and we were marginally successful. Um, and that's a whole nother talk. But the point being is we're trying to use this work as well to build a platform for advocacy and policy initiatives too, which is really critical when you're pursuing this, this tech equity line of research. And the, the paper in the far right lower column um, for you is one that um, was a very um, special uh, publication led by Dr. Michelle Porsche, and it was um, involving us as faculty going through a duo ethnography process where we reflected on our own positionality, our intersectionality, and what we bring to this work around co-design of these types of interventions. And um, it was really a formative experience participating in that publication and seeing um, it get disseminated and encouraging other researchers to think about those pieces of your work and bringing that to the forefront. Okay, so now we got a little bit of choose your own adventure because there is no way by 920 I would be able to talk about all of our projects. Um, I'm so proud of our team. None of this would happen without any of them, but I thought I would give you the option of picking uh, two up to two projects you would like to hear about. So I'm gonna go through, just give you like a one-liner about each. I will say, spoiler alert, I am gonna talk about foster space. So I'm gonna start off with foster space and then you can pick two through six and we're gonna do an everywhere poll. So foster space I'll get to, but the Foster Care Family Mental Health Navigator is our partnership with San Francisco Department of Public Health Foster Care Mental Health Clinic. It's an NIMH R34 that's testing the efficacy of a navigator intervention versus their standard of care, which is case management and looking on services outcomes for youth in foster care adolescents. Family Telehealth Project is um, a family-based intervention that is designed to be delivered to caregivers of origin and youth who are foster care involved and who could be an in or out of home placement. It's now a statewide available intervention. Text 2 is our text messaging intervention for youth in, who are referred to substance use treatment and are on probation. It's a dyadic intervention. Motivational text messaging, motivational text messages are sent to youth and caregiver. And that group that is randomized to that condition is compared to youth and caregivers who get appointment only reminder messaging. And we're looking at motivation to engage in treatment and attendance. 
Project ECHO is our workforce development and capacity building project with behavioral health care providers who serve system impacted youth. And last but not least, our youth justice and family well-being technology collaborative. That is our San Francisco city and county cross systems collaborative focused on strategies to build infrastructure to increase access to behavioral health care using technology. So I'm going to ask you to put this, uh, this link into your phone or your computer, whatever you might have open. Sorry, I couldn't figure out a way to have you hyperlink it. And um, go ahead and just rank order your preferences. And then technically we should start seeing results once folks submit. This is where it may all go south. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh, were you able to see it? Oh, great. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Sure. Okay. I see. Yes. Um, if anyone is on Zoom and wants to turn their video off, please do feel free. Um, it's a little harder for us to see the slides in the room for those who are in person. Not that we don't want to see you. We do. We're very happy you're here. Oh, apparently we can switch it. Yeah, because they are small, aren't they? <laughs> okay. Oh, whoa. Uh-oh, we got a tie. Oh. I should have said my our team members who are out there are have to recuse themselves from the vote. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll tell you one more thing. I'll, I'll I'll just one more thing. Thank you so much, Manny. One more thing as you're voting, in case you haven't submitted um, text two, we don't yet have results for. I'm gonna explain to you what we're doing and share some things. Um, and Family Mental Health Navigator, we don't either. Um, we do have results for Family Telehealth Project. Whoa, this is really switching around. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, everyone, we're good? Has everyone in the room gotten? Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna talk about foster space and then the Youth Justice and Family Wellbeing Technology Collaborative. And uh, if we can get to it, the Family Telehealth Project. But to be continued otherwise. Thank you, everyone. All right, let's talk about foster space. So um, foster space supported by a generous uh, donor um, is a tech-driven mental health hub for foster care youth and young adults. And um, uh, the challenge was that there are approximately 325 San Francisco transitional age foster care youth who need mental health and our substance use services. And our data showed from the foster care mental health clinic, for example, that young people are waiting four to five months for care. This was even prior to COVID. Uh, once they have had to do their mandated CANS child and adolescent needs and strengths assessment screening um, that's legislatively mandated to attend, they still wait five months to get into care. So we uh, and colleagues in this room, Dr. Fortuna, Porsche, Folk, everyone, um, came up with uh, this idea of coming, developing an app, but co-designing an app, and I'll talk about what that means, to um, provide immediate access to resources by county, specifically for foster care youth, a navigator who is uh, a person-powered navigator, but folk functioning online through chat, telehealth, and then immediate access to evidence-based therapy services. And the goal was to pilot with 30 youth over a 12-month evaluation period. And we wanted to reduce the amount of time to wait to get to service. We wanted to enhance engagement with services through the navigator. And we wanted to see a decrease in psychiatric symptoms and reduce substance use. Now, the very first thing we did was recruit and engage young people who have current and lived experience, current past, current and past, excuse me, current and past lived experience as a foster care youth. 
And we intentionally wanted to hire them, which is another aspect of the work, right? Is building the workforce to co-design this technology with us from the ground up. So I'm gonna play a demo of Foster Space so you can get an idea of what the app looks like. And then I'd like to play um, a testimonial from one or two of the Foster Space Advisory Board, they're now called the FAB. They continue to work with us. Foster Space was co-designed in collaboration with our Foster Space Advisory Board. The FAB is made up of Bay Area foster youth who are passionate about empowering their community. Sorry. With Foster Space, you can take charge of your mental wellness, keep track of your mood with the Foster Space Daily Mood Tracker, take an emotional wellness assessment so your clinical care team can provide support based on your needs, or check out our catalog of wellness resources carefully peer co-designers and UCSF care team. Foster Space is here for you. Just reach out to us via the Foster Space chat function and a member of our team will be available to answer your questions. Find helpful resources in your community. If local resources are what you're looking for, Foster Space has you covered. Search county specific resources by service need. Personalize your list further by using the like function. And as always, you can reach out to one of our navigators for questions about available resources. Organize and set personal goals. As a Foster Space user, you can create missions to help you achieve your personal goals. Feeling stuck? Reach out to the Foster Space Care Team for additional support creating missions. Registering for the app is easy and we have your back if you have any questions. Register today at fosterspace.com and you can learn more at this extension here. And okay, great. So, so that's an example of what the app looks like and the services. Those voices that you heard were the fab. They wanted to do the voiceovers. And I'm going to just play um, a testimonial from the okay, and um, testimonial of uh, from the one of the um, lab members, and hopefully this will work. This is Tilia. Uh, my name is Tilia Lundberg. Uh, right now I'm a college student. I'm now officially a senior at UC Berkeley and I'm majoring in psychology with a minor in clinical and counseling psychology. So double psychology. Being a foster youth and how that looks like with the insurance you have and maybe the situations you're in. So it's easy to listen to what someone else says or maybe to not speak up about how you're feeling. And I think the app brings a really good space where people can share that stuff and feel safe and heard. You know, sometimes mental health can be put on the back burner and I think this is easy and like accessible way that foster youth can start looking in and like uh, reaching out for help with their mental health as well as other resources because the app offers housing resources, food, and so much more too. Seeing it grow, one, because I know it's just in the Bay Area right now, and seeing you know how it could grow in the future, as well as maybe I have younger siblings, so I might encourage them even to use it. So I'm, I'm just interested to see how it ends up affecting people having that there for them. Okay, we're having some tech issues. We knew it was going to happen in a tech talk. Um, I'm going to play. Is it echoing to you? No. It's just low. Okay, I can make it louder. Um, and so what I'm going to do, um, I wanted to show you this as well. And then I'm going to talk about some stats with the app. But the fab also wanted to make their own videos to do skills building with the young people who would use the app. And I just want to show you just an example of um, TIP, which is from Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. 
um, at, and what JJ Hi, my name is JJ Chuheke. I am a founding member of the Peer Advisory Board and a co-designer on the Foster Space team. Right now, you may be experiencing strong emotions or body sensations. This is all okay. You are not alone. Here are four skills that can help calm your body called TIPP, T-I-P-P. T stands for temperature. Changing your body temperature can help you decrease the intensity of the emotion. Splashing cold water on your face or holding an ice cube can help regulate a strong flight or fight response. The I in TIP stands for intense exercise. Intense exercise increases oxygen to the brain and reduces anxiety. Going for a run, doing jump. So I just wanted to show you a little sample of that. Um, these young people are incredible. Uh, right now, Dylan is uh, just was on a meeting with us yesterday and um, told us he's campaigning for Fetterman right now. All of a sudden, he's in Pennsylvania knocking on 22,000 doors. So I said to him, 22,000 doors, what, in eight days or something? He said, and I said to him, great, you can come back and do that for foster space. You know, and knock on 22,000 doors to get us more users. And you'll see why I said that. Um, because we've had, in six months, we've had 100 uh, people access the app. And 45 of those have been ineligible. Uh, very few non-foster care youth, but many were out of the age range of 18 to 26 years initially. We have now just been able to manage the consents and the liabilities related to including 13 to 17 year olds. So as of September 1st, 2022, we now have this, these services available through the app for ages 13 through 26. Um, when it says out of county, it's just because right now we have started off with Bay Area County, but I will tell you we have, uh, we're moving toward California statewide expansion right now to increase the number of users and increase access. Um, but of the 55 who are eligible, 18 only registered to use foster space. They're all 18 to 26 year olds so far. We don't have any adolescents, 13 to 17 years old. 37 did not complete registration. So this is flagging for us a bit and we need to do more research. This is like, these are all new data. We've just pulled these, um, but this is really suggesting to us that something is going on for these young people. And if we think about tequity and we think about those pillars, like kind of what's going on there where we've got that group of young people who are eligible, but are really just not signing up. We have to figure that out. Um, and if you can see by county, it looks like uh, Alameda, Contra Costa County and San Francisco are in the largest um, numbers of people accessing from those counties. Um, if we look more closely at our 18 users to date, um, half of them are from Alameda County and then they're spread across San Mateo, San Francisco and Contra Costa largely. But we also have some in Santa Clara and Santa Cruz and um, we are, um, partnering, uh, <coughs> excuse me, partnering with um, probation departments in those counties as well. So in terms of what those users accessed, in that demo, you saw that you could kind of do like a virtual tour mission. That was kind of what you did by watching the demo video. 14 users actually did that. And then um, five users also completed the virtual orientation with Navigator, who's actually in the audience today. Um, so, um, and when we look to see how, what the types of resources, so what they do when they enter into the app, let me just walk you through for a second. They enter into the app, they have access immediately to say kind of what are they interested in, in terms of resource areas, and they check off a list. And this is what this resource needs request is. It's showing that the majority actually checked off they want resources in emotional wellness. So we're, we know we're kind of hitting the mark there a little bit, at least in terms of who's accessing. But this is why we have to define mental health broadly. Mental health is about all of these categories, because even though emotional wellness 
is indicating that, you know, that that's the highest proportion of resource need. We see very high rates for transportation, health, employment. Um, and so we need to think about broadening our definition of what mental health and well being is for these young people. We have a mood tracker where they do like a face, they indicate what, what kind of mood they're in. 13 of those 18 use the mood tracker. Only four use the emotional wellness survey. So despite us seeing that there's high requests for resources in that area, here's another area where we need to look into why out of those who expressed emotional wellness resource need, only four used our emotional wellness survey, which is the DSM screener, but it is the first level of it for the measure. So it is not going into in-depth clinical questions off the bat, but maybe there's something about our screener that is turning off these young people. Um, and just so you know, it was 18 to 23 year old. One of the users from the Emotional Wellness Survey, which is where we get the demographics, didn't uh, disclose any of their uh, age, race, um, ethnicity, or gender data. Um, when we look at the mood tracker, I just wanted to show you a snapshot of this for the 13 who used the mood tracker and the four who completed the emotional wellness screener. The majority of them used the mood tracker just once and three users used it two to 15 times. Um, only two of these young people engaged with navigator supports. And when they, these four completed the screener, four actually, all of them needed the higher level next step screener, suggesting that they really did flag for emotional health and wellness needs. One flagged in the domain of mania, and then three flagged across multiple, all domains, substance use, anxiety, depression. Um, the process that we set up was for the clinician to reach out to the young person once they pass the level one screener, if they flag for the level two screener. And what we found was that three of the four we could not reach. So there wasn't anything clinically like um, disclosed that was a risk of harm to self or others, but there was an, a, a higher need. And then we weren't able to reach those three out of four to complete the second level screener that we decided does need to be done by a clinician through telehealth in case there is an imminent safety risk. One um, completed and is actively engaged in teletherapy with our clinician through the app. And that's the one who's also been using the mood tracker 15 times. So um, I'll talk about the next steps, but we have a lot of work to do in this area. This is the first of its kind. Um, mental health app for this population. And we're consulting with our foster space advisory board uh, very, very regularly. And also our technology partner, Chorus, about how to think about breaking through some of these access barriers. Like, are we creating these access barriers un inadvertently? Um, is there something else about these users, which for, unfortunately we don't have information on them and we don't have a way to reach them. So we're now trying to figure out how can we actually get feedback on the spot from those who don't even register, for example, but who peruse the app? Okay. So in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about, if I can get my, sorry, if I can find my cursor. Now this is where, aha, it worked. Okay. So um, I believe the, the project that everybody wanted to hear about the most was the Youth Justice and Family Wellbeing Technology Collaborative. So I was talking more about individual level intervention, right, through the Foster Space app. And dyadic couples or family um, therapy, right, could be available to that young person if they wanted it, if it was um, clinically indicated. And... So that was like at the smallest level of the eco-developmental framework. Now we've gone out to the macro level, right? So we're, and our group would suggest that these interventions need to happen concurrently such that one is informing the other consistently and we're breaking through structural barriers uh, to increasing healthcare access. So this is an academic public systems partnership between UCSF 
and San Francisco Unified Family Court and Honorable Judge Wiley, who is um, an incredible advocate for youth uh, injustice and mental health needs. And our mission is to improve access to behavioral health care for system involved youth by leveraging technology. So I've already talked to you about the need for this. And the systems barrier is that we have primarily siloed systems that hamper cross system collaboration and coordination to improve access. So this collaborative came together, and I'll talk about that process a little bit, to leverage technological advances and system leaders desire to improve access through cross system care coordination, data sharing, and family services navigation. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was our process of stakeholders and phases. <clears throat> you can see here that there are seven systems involved. And we started this work in January 2020, before COVID. We had our first meeting. So come March of 2020, the group that was comprised of one to two stakeholders consistently from each of these systems. And these are high level administrator or, and also directors of programs in San Francisco Unified, for example, Department of Public Health, um, Children, Youth and Families. And March hit and every, it was supposed to be quarterly meetings and everybody said, can we please meet monthly? And it was an incredible systems bonding experience to be able to talk about all the barriers um, and concerns about how do they quickly launch technology to address the COVID-19 epidemic. So we expanded within that framework to start to develop subcommittees. And because the cross systems coordination discussions really highlighted to everyone many, many gaps in the system of care that each was not aware of the other, by the way. So there were, you know, child welfare and probation might meet to have family case conferences for care planning for a young person, right? But the judge is not in the same room. To have the judge as a part of this and leading this is really pioneering in many ways, I will say, because many of the conversations don't, um, like courts and child welfare will meet, right, typically, um, so we were really bringing together all of these um, systems. We continue to meet consistently on a monthly basis in this collaborative. Subcommittees have been formed that are guided by the stakeholders' vision and identified needs. And they identified the cascade of care for services as a real framework that they wanted to step into to start to develop these cross-system strategies. So um, they came up with a subcommittee around initial access so how do we get together across our systems to improve initial access from assessment to identifying treatment needs to referral? And how do we think about retention in care? So these were two different um, subcommittees. There are multiple outcomes that have already um, occurred related to this group. And I'll tell you too, they have also become an advisory group for our various tech equity projects. So for foster space, for foster care, mental health, now all of those projects that I presented to you earlier, they are all involved in advising and thinking about and referring. So um, there are projects that have been completed. One of the ones that um, was really um, exciting uh, for us is I didn't get a chance to talk about Project ECHO, which is our workforce development, but this is like a perfect example of when you do the structural intervention, how it can inform individual group family level intervention. Basically a subcommittee was formed in partnership with the CBO Horizons that provides adolescent substance use treatment. And we co-developed, co-designed with them a co-occurring substance use and trauma curriculum that was now delivered throughout the counties in California now, the California Behavioral Health Care Providers Association is our next cohort to, to train that workforce serving system impacted youth in co-occurring substance use and trauma interventions. So that's a direct example of how this collaborative informed the work happening directly in the community. 
So we just looked in the last few minutes, I'll just talk about some of our outcomes that we've published in the Journal of Behavioral Health Services Research. Um, and one of the things we did was we assessed kind of these system um, level components and looked at readiness and change in these areas for the collaborative across the systems. So we use something called the technology capacity assessment tool. And we use that to inform technology capacity strengthening plans and also ideas for these subcommittees and projects that they wanted to develop. And this TCAT um, measures, has 68 items and it measures in domains of organizational readiness. So is strategic planning in place, for example, for technology? Um, are there existing staff and organizational readiness? Um, for there is an actual technology domain, right? So it's asking questions like, in your system, has investment already been made? Is there available infrastructure? Regulatory and policy, it's asking systems to answer, are there security practices in place, privacy, information sharing concerns, credentialing, licensing around these pieces of technology um, utilization for behavioral healthcare access, financing and reimbursement. So asking, um, about what system is gonna pay for what technology, right? And how ready is your system to embrace that conversation or how far along the path have you already gone to looking at reimbursement in your system, probation, child welfare, you know, courts, behavioral health. Clinical was really focused on how does technology align with the system missions and goals? Um, how does cultural responsiveness look in delivering telehealth, for example? and um, record keeping and confidentiality concerns. All of these were so, you know, really on the map when COVID hit. Um, and then workforce, really looking at employee motivation, burnout, like in their systems, how does M health or how does digital health impact their own work and duties? And so um, they completed the 68 item TCAT tool at three time points, 20 key stakeholders completed it. We measured at baseline three and six months, so over an 18 month period. Um, and then we analyzed the identified meeting notes as well across 17 meetings. And most people were in their position for about 11 years across the systems. Majority identified as female, um, mean age was about 46 years. And so just some main findings for you to take away from here. So organizational readiness was initially very low, but it generally improved or stayed the same over time. So we didn't have a comparison collaborative that was focused on some other content, right? So these are just pre-post changes, but it felt that it was very encouraging that we saw this shift in organizational readiness related to technology and capacity to deploy technology tools to increase access to care. Most systems reported building tech-related capacity within each domain over the first 12 months. We weren't surprised by that because everybody was forced to within the systems related to COVID. Um, but by 18 months, this capacity building process stalled or marginally declined. And we're starting to see that in our meetings too, with feeling like we've got to keep the momentum going here around how we approach tech equity and how we continue to leverage technology to increase access to care. The technology domain was an obvious focus for discussion, right? So talking about deploying Chromebooks to SFUSD and using those Chromebooks to actually access court hearings. We had to work with SFUSD and the courts to allow those computers to be used for that, which was huge. We just recently found out, right, that San Francisco Unified isn't deploying those Chromebooks anymore. So how is that impacting our young people getting to their court hearings and potential violations for not attending their serious ramifications? Um, but they identified barriers um, around staff delivering telehealth appropriately. The systems don't have the infrastructure and the resources to continue to support probation staff, for example, in this domain, overburdened IT systems and these inequities in youth and family access that I just brought up again. Um, regulatory and policy was discussed the least, um, but it was actually um, highly rated on the technology capacity assessment tool. So we thought that maybe that meant that they were um, felt really confident in their regulatory and policy capacity to implement technology kind of in their silos 
but weren't really interested. Like the conversations that happen, I'm not going to go through the meeting notes in detail, but you can certainly, the paper identifies the key themes, but, you know, just being in the space every month for over the past two years, they, um, there was a lot of, we just use different systems and excuse me. And this is something that we really need to be thinking about how to break through at the larger systems level, right? We know this in the healthcare system too, but we have got to start thinking about policies and initiatives to systematize this access. And so one of the projects now that the Tech Collaborative is engaged in is called the Duly Involved Youth Database. And um, what that database is designed to do hasn't yet happened and it's supported by the Bench to School Initiative. Um, what it's designed to do is to bring together all of the information that's usually sitting with a case manager, right? Sitting with Department of Public Health clinicians, sitting with the judge, sitting in a file somewhere that they don't have access to and bringing it all together into a report that would then help judges make keen dispositions around behavioral health care and have access to the history of behavioral health care utilization. Um, and that has really come out of these uh, pushes to say we're not talking about these regulatory and policy issues sufficiently um, to de-silo across systems. And then we're expanding to Contra Costa County. So um, I'm not going to get into that in detail. That's in process, but we're very excited. Contra Costa County is really interested in replicating the Tech Collaborative. And due to generous funding from the Tipping Point Foundation, we're developing a digital health toolkit which is gonna be a recipe online for how other counties can build these types of tech collaboratives. And our goal is to measure the outcomes associated with structural shifts related to that collaborative. So in closing, um, some common challenges and future directions Expanded access, right, uh, to care and achieving tech equity is highly complex. I've only presented to you two projects today, um, but the need is there and the complexity is there as well. We need to think about our limited expansion um, and that as a barrier, and we must overcome those barriers to expand studies California-wide and nationally but building trusting relationships and participatory co-design tools with historically excluded groups is really um, antithetical in some ways, the experience of it with this need to expand, right? And bring to scale. We work so closely with our young people in foster space. Um, and we need to think about how to bring to scale these co-design models in a way that continues to build trust with those communities. We haven't figured this out yet, so I'm open to any and all suggestions. Um, it's really difficult to obtain information on non-users to inform Techquity, which you heard. So we need to build our platform such that non-registered users feel comfortable providing demographic info and feedback on why they're not using. You can build it, but will they use it, right? So we need to continue to um, question potential gains versus potential harms. Is that preventing access? We need to understand how to be in this conversation with young people and families and the systems. And today you chose two projects that actually are a perfect example of how we need to start thinking about that. And we're thinking about the possibility of a youth tech collaborative that would be like um, ambassadors and co-designing with the systems collaborative. And we actually put in for an application and didn't end up getting funded for it, but we're still working on that. We think that that would be a great next step. And then we've got public systems with competing priorities and mandates. So we need to leverage existing mandates like CalAIM, Family First Prevention Act, right? D Department of Juvenile Justice realignment. We need to leverage those policies and those mandates to actually get systems to concurrently engage in de-siloing and talking about cross-system strategies for policy initiatives. Sorry, I didn't leave too much time for questions, but I can stick around. I might, um, so can I throw some questions out that were in the chat since, I, since some people may have to leave from the, the um, online. So there were so there's lots of comments about excellent presentation, wonderful sort of bringing up youth voices, 
um, there's two sort of areas of questions. One is on, um, are you uh, aware of well-validated measures of emotional wellness in adolescents? And can the can a clinician access the wellness uh, emotional wellness screener that you have? Yeah. So what we used was a DSM cross-cutting symptom measure, which is a well-validated measure, and that's available online. We're happy to send you a link as well. We did have our young people look at the items, right, and um, ensure that they were comfortable with them. They had some changes they wanted to make, which was a challenge because it's an empirically validated tool. Okay. Great. And then there was a few questions about how to really improve access, right, to the therapy and the behavioral health. And so there was one question about, you know, how do you address the need for more child psychiatrists if they actually, you know, there's not enough. So how do you help with the access to that? Um, Is there a role for peer support to be able to bridge from, you know, needing access to actually getting to therapy? How do you address those, you know, workforce issues? Yes. So yes to all of that. Um, So for child psychiatry, we're we're having discussions in my new inaugural vice chair role about various ways of incentivizing loan repayment programs are not an incentivization, are not incentivizing in many ways because um, it requires certain steps before you can even get that loan repayment in place. So we're thinking about upfront, what are some incentives to get more people into the field, but we certainly have to start the pipeline much, much earlier on, um, which is related to the Change SF program that Michelle Porsche and Lisa Fortuna are also heavily involved in and thinking about how we build the generation, but starting earlier. I know it's not an immediate impact, I want to say something about the peer supports too. There is a burgeoning literature coming out about peer supports and even for young people. And I say even for young people, because for years it's been, no, you can only do that with adults. No, you can only do that with adults. We are developing in the foster space advisory board. They are already doing a coaching, a peer coaching. And our goal ultimately is to train train them in actually being able to deliver more intervention based Mm -hmm. uh, approaches through the app. So there's absolutely a space for peers. And Joanna Folk is doing it with caregivers of detained youth, a peer based approach. Okay, great. Just want to give a moment to see if others have questions. There's one more, but want to give. Oh, I just want to say too, there's the science for that is yeah. really lacking. So we really need empirically supported approaches. And for the peer support. For the peer support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for the talk. Um, really cool stuff. I'm just wondering in terms of the peer support things and um, especially kind of the safety issues around <clears throat> technology, especially for youth. How do we ensure the safety of our young people, especially if we engage in kind of peer and yeah. how do we monitor, I guess? Yeah, thank you for raising that. Um, it needs to be a multi-layered approach. Um, we need to have clinicians or trained, so who are going to be fewer in number, right, who could supervise, for example, and provide supports to a large group of peers who could then deploy the interventions. I think that's the way I'm putting in various safeguards that way. Um, I think that support needs to be there for the peers as well, because they hear things and see things um, that can honestly be traumatizing and triggering for them too. So we really do need to make sure that the supports are in place and that would potentially, right, prevent harms to others as well. Everything is multi-level, multi-layer, complex in this work, and it has to be. Yeah. Maybe we can fit one more question. Do you think that there needs to be a different portal for or a different component of, say, foster space for substance use or vaping or those kinds of needs? Is that someone wanting to create that? (laughs) (laughs) yes it's needed we do provide evidence-based substance use treatment within foster space but this is something actually that we're looking at even like kind of tracks of specialized um, care um, and we know that substance use is a huge issue and co-occurring substance use and mental health so vaping cessation that goes all of it I don't know who that was but if they want to talk to me afterward that would be great (laughs) Mm-hmm. Done there. Just a lots of comments of excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.